Thanks for everyone for attending today's webcast on, on, on the 2020 City Clean Energy Scorecard. Um, you know, the first thing we're going to be doing is presenting the, the findings of the um, 100 City Scorecard, which is the most comprehensive report um, tracking city progress towards goals. Um, our panel will, will then discuss and explore what cities are doing and can do better to advance energy efficiency and, and renewable power. Um, they will share their programs uh, and how they are based on community input and designed to serve all residents. Uh, before we start, I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping out items. So your screen is completely customizable uh, and each area can be minimized or maximized for easier viewing in the upper right hand corner. If you are unable to see the presenter or slides, click through the widgets at the bottom. Feel free to submit questions to our panelists anytime throughout the hour by using the Q&A engagement tool that appears on your screen and as a widget at the bottom. You'll see several other helpful widgets um, as well, including speaker bios and a resource list to download materials from today's webcast. There's also a help widget for audio and webcam troubleshooting. We will prioritize questions from member of the media. So if you are press, please include your note in the outlet, uh, your, uh, in the note, um, what your outlet is in the chat box. And a recording of this webcast will be made available uh, and all participants will receive the link within a couple days. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, so the first one will be myself, um, the Director of Policy of Local Policy at ACEEE. Then Mark Chambers, the Director of Sustainability at the City of New York. Then we have Jessica Ben Coven, uh, Director of the Office of Sustainability and Environment in uh, Seattle, Washington. And Russ Stark, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of uh, St. Paul. Um, so we will start with me. Um, again, I'm the director of the local policy uh, program at ACEEE and the lead author of the report. Um, so I'll be presenting on the, the city scorecard's key findings. Um, and as I was saying before, this edition is the most comprehensive scorecard we have released to date. We've increased the amount of cities we assess from 75 in the last year's edition to 100 in this edition. These cities alone make up nearly 20% of the U.S. population. The metropolitan areas in which they are located contain 65% of the population. The scorecard ranks these large U.S. cities on their efforts to achieve a clean energy future by improving energy efficiency and scaling up renewable energy. It identifies those that excel and those with the most room to improve. We also look at city efforts to incorporate equity into planning and program delivery capturing the extent to which city actions are designed to serve all. We developed the scores by evaluating each of the cities on policy metrics across five policy areas, namely government operations, community initiatives, buildings, utilities, and transportation. When combined, the results from these policy areas provide a total score for each city that allows us to rank them. So with that, why don't we get to the results of the 2020 City Clean Energy Scorecard? And here we are. So this map ranks the, or shows the ranks of all 100 cities in the report. New York City earns first place and does so for the first time. New York's buildings policies were the key factor in its rise to the top. The city has strong building energy codes and several policies to increase energy efficiency in existing buildings. Since the previous edition of the City Scorecard, New York has taken a major step forward by adopting Local Law 97 of 2019 and setting greenhouse gas emissions caps for large buildings. New York is followed by Seattle and Boston, both tied for second. Each has continued to show leadership on clean energy. Among its many achievements, Seattle was a top performing city for equity and planning and program delivery. It was due in part to its equity and environment agenda which seeks to advance racial equity and environmental planning, as well as efforts to deliver clean, efficient transportation options for low-income communities. Boston has strong buildings policies, including its building energy code and its benchmarking ordinance that calls for efficiency improvements. The city is also pursuing municipal choice aggregation and has strengthened electric vehicle readiness codes. Rounding out the top 10 are Minneapolis and San Francisco, both tied for fourth, followed by Washington, D.C., Denver, Los Angeles, San Jose, and Oakland. And San Jose and Oakland entered the top 10 for the first time. 
44 of the returning 75 cities improved their score since the last edition of the city scorecard. But as you saw on the map on the last slide, we had two most improved cities, namely St. Paul and St. Louis. St. Paul is the most overall improved city in the 2020 city scorecard. The city has made improvements across the board. By adopting its climate action and resilience plan, the city set a 2050 carbon neutrality goal. The city passed an energy benchmarking ordinance to increase energy efficiency in existing buildings. The city council took steps to reduce transportation related admissions by approving the St. Paul 2040 comprehensive plan. By doing so, it set a goal to decrease vehicle miles traveled. The city also became the anchor subscriber for a community solar project. St. Louis was the second most improved city. Its adoption of the Building Energy Performance Standard Bill was the primary driver of its improved score. By adopting it, St. Louis became the third city in the country and the first in the Midwest to enact a performance standard for buildings. The city's other developments include adopting a solar readiness requirement and encouraging more utility scale renewable energy. Our research shows that many cities are adopting new policies, creating new programs, and strengthening existing ones. We found that cities had taken more than 160 new actions between April 2019 and May 2020. Some of these are practical, impactful policies, like Albuquerque's executive instruction for increasing efficiency in the city's municipal fleets. Others are cutting edge, like New York City's and St. Louis's performance standards. More than 50 cities pursued at least one initiative, with most cities ranked between 1st and 60th taking at least one step after the 60th rank new policy activity tapered off. The list for all 160 plus actions is available in the city scorecard report itself, and you can check it out there. The figure here shows those actions with the most uptake. As you can see, we saw lots of cities pushing for more renewable energy. For example, Columbus is supporting its utilities proposal to install 900 megawatts of renewable energy. Cleveland advocated for keeping Ohio's renewable and energy efficiency standards in place. And San Diego and Boston are currently pursuing municipal aggregation. We're also encouraged to see cities taking steps to further integrate equity into their work. For example, Providence, who is already a leader for it, released the Climate Justice Plan to provide a vision for an inclusive and equitable low carbon future. The city's Racial and Environmental Justice Committee, made up of frontline community members, spearheaded plan development. Sacramento, like several other cities, created the Environmental Justice Working Group. Among its work is providing guidance on the environmental justice elements of upcoming plans. As in any addition in the scorecard, though, the news is not all positive. Um, the policy improvements I just discussed are encouraging but there's significant room for cities to emulate leaders and adopt clean energy policy. We looked at performance over time to get a sense for how cities may be closing the gap with leaders. The methodology we used to do that is described more fully in the report. In a nutshell though, we looked at the average top scoring city and compared its performance to the average bottom performing city over the last four city scorecard editions. As you can see in the figure, the score disparity is wide and consistent across all three editions with it being right around 50 points in each case. The consistent score differential means bottom scoring cities have not yet significantly gained ground on the high achievers. Even in this year's edition, the extent to which leading cities are out ahead of the pack is clear. Totaling the scores across all cities in the report, you'd get around 3,000 total points. That's a proxy for the scale of clean energy leadership in cities. The top 15 cities in the report earn one third of those total points. Uh, for comparison purposes, the bottom 15 earn 4%. If municipalities are to scale up efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions broadly, more cities throughout the rankings will need to realize more comprehensive policy, policy accomplishments. As in past editions, we also looked at progress towards near-term climate goals by looking at trends and emissions profiles. While we were happy to find that more cities are projected to be on track to achieve their goals than last time, this represented only a minority of cities. The figure summarizes our findings. So as in the last edition, while most cities have goals, slightly more than a third do not. Of the 63 cities with goals, 29 are not yet fully tracking their progress. 
Of the 34 cities with goals and data to assess them, 20 cities are on track, with another five projected to make substantial progress but still fall short. So what are the takeaways from this? Well, 29 cities having goals but not fully tracking progress stands out. We hope that more data becomes available over time so we can get a better picture of city progress. Depending upon how greenhouse gas emissions are changing in these 29 cities, the picture across all cities could change significantly. Second, uh, the 34 cities for which we assess progress. As in the last edition, if you look at cities on track and close to being on track, that's 25 of 34 cities, which isn't bad. And of the nine cities that are on track in this edition, um, which is an improvement, those are returning cities from the last scorecard. So you see actual movement and improvement from last time. But with only 20 cities being projected to be on track, there's more to do. Some cities may need to redouble their efforts. And in other cases, it's likely that city policy actions and the resulting GHG emissions reductions just haven't showed up in emissions profiles yet. Future scorecards will help us figure that out. The report has a number of other takeaways too that I list here. Um, for example, we found increasing efforts to increase engagement with low-income communities and communities of color. In particular, equity-driven planning models in Minneapolis, Providence, Portland, and Seattle are encouraging. Across cities, though, there's still more work to do. We also gauge the extent to which states are helping or inhibiting policy. Unsurprisingly, we found California to be helping the most, while states like Virginia and Wisconsin are holding back cities. Other findings are related to buildings, the transportation sector, and renewable energy. If anyone has questions about them, I'm happy to discuss further dur during the Q&A. Um, and we'll, with that, I will turn back to Lauren. Um, Lauren, are you with us? Yes, thank you, Dave. Um, our next speaker is Mark Chambers, Director of Sustainability for New York City. I should also use this time to congratulate New York for placing first in, in this year's scorecard in major achievement. And now to Mark, who will talk, talk about his city's clean energy efforts. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully everyone can hear me well. Um, uh, it's good to be here. I, I wanted to say you know, thank you, of course, for having us here today. It's an absolute honor to be recognized um, in the number one spot, although I'm sure uh, people are used to New Yorkers thinking they're number one, so it's good to have uh, sometimes backup that helps that out. Uh, so, but again, thank you. Uh, today's acknowledgement is very meaningful for our city. And I think it's a result of a lot of hard work, not just from, you know, from my team, but from a collective work uh, from New York City government, as well as a lot of the community leaders and residents that, that make this city move. Um, and we've been able to achieve a lot of these, these outcomes, um, not just because we have a, ambitious goals around decarbonizing our entire economy by 2050, but because we've been systematically putting policies in place that chip away at some of the, the systematic um, obstacles that really get us to be able to move forward. And for us in New York City, that has a lot to do with tackling the number one source of our emissions, which is the buildings here in New York City. We have over a million buildings in our city, and that really just makes it uh, have to be the core of our climate response. Um, and so last year, when we were able to kind of move forward um, with uh, what we call the Climate Mobilization Act, we really knew that we had to be tackling buildings at, at the core of that. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, of our citywide emissions, um, only 2% of buildings really make up for a, a significant portion of those emissions. Those are the biggest buildings in New York City, ones over 25,000 square feet. So for us, that's really where we, we put a lot of our attention. And this landmark law that we passed, Local Law 97, which um, Dave mentioned earlier, was really um, something that put us on the on the right path to being able to truly tackle that for the, the next decade to come. Uh, we also, while we were passing Local Law 97, which I'll explain a little bit more about, uh, we were able to subsequently um, pass additional laws with things like mandatory green roofs and solar on on all new buildings, uh, as well as looking at ways for us to execute a carbon trading study, which would um, implement potentially the first of its kind um, carbon trading program amongst uh, buildings throughout our city uh, with a pre uh, prominent focus on how we can do that in a way that 
um, that helps us combat um, social inequality as well and focusing on environmental justice neighborhoods. So that's part of how we're looking at continually building and moving more uh, towards um, a not just a just city, but one that can effectively tackle a lot of the challenges. And we didn't want this this law to be something where it's just putting it out there and hopefully everyone can respond to. Uh, systematically, we we're looking at how can we make sure that we're ensuring success uh, for building owners and meeting them where they are and giving them tools to be successful. One of those additional ways is that we also pass a law at the same time to enable PACE financing, which is property assessed clean energy financing, so that these building owners can take out low interest, long-term loans to truly be able to capitalize the work and make sure they're moving forward quickly and that their interior environments can benefit from all of the retrofits that we need in order to meet our goals. So putting forward the, the tools to make sure they're gonna be successful, putting the guardrails in place to make sure that we're guiding on a, on a path towards energy efficiency for the worst polluters in our in our city. And then also making sure that we're, we're identifying the fact that this will kick off an incredible job growth throughout our city. I mean, we estimated originally around 26,000 um, jobs would be created just from the implementation of this law. We know it's going to be much, much more than that. Uh, studies have come out that have looked at this catalyzing a $20 billion retrofit market in our city. So we are excited to see where this goes, excited to give everyone the resources and the help they need to be able to be um, be successful. But we're also excited to continue to be a, a leader and be an example uh, for other cities. And hopefully the work that we do here can truly de-risk a lot of this work for other cities. Um, and so we are, again, grateful um, to be able to be here and and help um, advance just the work we're doing here, but also again, unlock the potential for more cities to join us. Uh, I'm excited to kind of share this uh, this honor with us uh, and my other fellow cities who are also doing incredible, uh, great work. And you know, now more than ever, there is a, a need for us to take aggressive action towards climate. Uh, the, you know, the nation is absolutely struggling to, um, uh, to resist multiple crises at, at the same time. And for us, we know that uh, the more work that we can do and the more infrastructure we can put in place to be able to um, push back against a changing climate is something that will allow for future generations to do many um, additional work and chipping away at some of those uh, systemic problems that allow for us to, to really uh, shift our, our carbon future in a way that's gonna allow for us to hang out as a species a little bit longer. So I'm grateful to all of you Thanks for um, for acknowledging our city today, and look forward to having this conversation in the Q and A to follow. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mark, Great. and congratulations again. We'll now move to the West Coast. We'll hear from Jessica Finn Coven, who directs Seattle's Office of Sustainability and Environment. Seattle tied tied for second place, moving up from third place last year. Jessica will discuss Seattle's work. Thank you so much. And thank you to ACEEE for this honor. Uh, the scorecard is just such a great affirmation of all cities' work in addressing the climate crisis and really serves as a tool for cities to learn from each other about programs and policies that can be replicated. Uh, we know efficient buildings powered with clean energy are key drivers of a resilient city. And here in Seattle, buildings are responsible for about a third of our climate pollution, and we know that that's growing. So addressing the sector is absolutely critical if we're going to confront the climate crisis. We also know that as cities confront current and historic racist policies like redlining and disproportionate lack of investment in communities of color, that ensuring buildings in all neighborhoods are healthy and powered by clean energy is just absolutely critical. So when looking at what we've done in Seattle, the way we've utilized our racial equity toolkits in designing new building policies is what I'm most proud of. These toolkits help us identify potentially impacted communities and then work to uh, maximize benefits and minimize burdens for those communities. To maximize benefits with 
efforts like our mandatory building tune-ups law. We've launched partnerships with community colleges and local unions to train the next generation of professionals to be certified tune-up specialists. We also plan to utilize fines for non-compliance with these laws to conduct upgrades in affordable housing sites to make sure our affordable housing is healthy, efficient, and resilient. And, you know, just as important as maximize benefits is minimizing burden. And to do this, we've created an overlay of multiple factors impacting each building, such as building age and seismic risk, and identified those buildings located in geographic areas with greater displacement risk so that we can tailor policies and support programs to ensure that everyone can benefit from a higher performance performing buildings, uh, while being careful not to create additional displacement pressures on owners and tenants with the least capacity. Taking uh, this intentional approach to our policies has resulted in a really high compliance rate for us. Um, we have over a 90% compliance rate for our energy benchmarking law and over 95% for buildings uh, 50,000 square feet and greater that have had to um, undergo building tune-ups so far. And while we're working to improve existing buildings and, and we are proud of these policies we have that focus on existing buildings, we also know it's best to just build right from the start. To do this, last year we passed an EV readiness ordinance that requires all new development that's built with parking to have the wiring and electrical power built out at the time of construction to electrify uh, half of newly constructed commercial parking stalls and 100% of residential stalls, because we know the future uh, is an electric one, not a fossil fuel powered one. And we continue to push the envelope with our Seattle Energy Code, which covers commercial and multifamily buildings. Three years ago, we developed our high performance heating criteria in the energy code that encouraged all new construction to use heat pumps rather than fossil gas or electric resistance heat. In this year, we're developing another code update that with limited exemptions will eliminate the option for fossil fuel use in space and water heating, and will also maximize energy efficiency and extend solar readiness requirements. So as we look to the future of building our city back from the COVID-19 crisis and building it back better than before, we know that our built environment is key. We need all buildings, commercial, multifamily, residential, to be fossil fuel free, toxin free, and affordable. Uh, Seattle is committed to creating a vibrant, livable, equitable city where all our communities and all our residents thrive. And we are grateful in doing that to have partners like ACEEE in that effort and the opportunity to learn from our fellow cities like New York and Minneapolis and so many others. And you heard Mark say that New York likes being number one. Uh, Seattle is also committed to striving for that number one spot next year, so he shouldn't get too comfortable. <laughs> Thanks again to the other cities and to ACEEE. Great, thank you, Jessica. And for our final speaker, we'll hear from Russ Stark. Russ is the Chief Resilient Officer for St. Paul, Minnesota, one of the two most improved cities along with St. Louis this year. St. Paul moved up 15 spots to 16th place this year. Russ will describe St. Paul's recipe for success. Take it away, Russ. Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to be with you this morning and thanks to ACEEE for this great recognition. Um, we are a city of about 315,000 people and proud to be uh, playing above our weight class a little bit with the likes of New York and Seattle here on the on the panel. Um, at the end of 2019, thanks to support from Mayor Melvin Carter and the City Council, we the Council unanimously passed our Climate Action and Resilience Plan, which did, as Dave mentioned, set goals of us being a net zero community by 2050, as well as reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030. Uh, in addition, both in our comprehensive plan and in that uh, climate plan, 
We set a target of 40% vehicle miles traveled reduced across our community by 2040. The reason that's significant and important is that in all of our modeling, we found that even with aggressive efforts to electrify transportation, uh, that uh, electrification alone would not be enough to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions sufficiently enough for us to meet our targets in time. We started a couple of years ago on the energy benchmarking pathway with a voluntary program called the Race to Reduce, which Mayor Carter loves to refer to as uh, the battle for the biggest loser. Um, and then just uh, in January of this year, we did approve uh, through the city council our energy benchmarking ordinance, uh, which went into effect uh, in July. So we're beginning to gather really good uh, data on our large buildings and their energy use. Unlike Seattle, uh, over 60% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy used in buildings, largely because we're up here in the Bolt North. And one of our challenges is that heating load in terms of moving toward clean energy. Uh, we have a, uh, a growing internal loan fund for energy efficiency projects in city buildings that we have deployed uh, at an accelerated pace over the last year or so. We're going to have changed out all of our city building light, light fixtures to LED uh, within about the next six months, and we're moving on to the next level of projects, including HVAC systems. Um, our oldest uh, contributor to our uh, relatively good scoring in this uh, scorecard is our city's sustainable building ordinance that requires that all uh, development projects receiving any sort of public funds, uh, $200,000 or more, have to meet a much higher uh, green building uh, set of requirements, including our state's SB 2030 program, which now requires that uh, buildings, uh, new construction is built 80% uh, less carbon intensive than the 2005 baseline. 2020 has been a big year in St. Paul for uh, construction of new bikeways. We have 20 miles of new bikeways going in this year alone, a record year for us, and nearly all of those miles are protected new bikeways. One of the projects we're most excited about that we're about to launch is an EV charging hubs project. It's actually shared uh, by uh, the city of St. Paul, the city of Minneapolis, our utility and a local nonprofit car share provider. We're going to install 70 hubs across the two cities with 280 ports, 100% renewable energy powered. And the hubs will each uh, provide service both for public EV charging as well as a new EV car share service provided by that local nonprofit partner. Uh, early next year, we're moving to entirely eliminate parking requirements in our zoning code, uh, with the uh, hopefully with the support of the city council. And right now we're in the midst of the creation of our first uh, climate justice advisory board following the lead of other communities um, and the intentions of Mayor Carter, uh, whose administration has really uh, put economic and racial justice uh, right up front. Our climate justice, uh, excuse me, our, our climate action resilience plan also really emphasizes um, racial and economic equity so that we are making sure that our transition to clean energy is a just one. Um, really appreciate the support of ACEEE. We've also been lucky to get support from the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge, which has been particularly helpful with that EV charging hubs project that I described. Thank you so much for this recognition, and we look forward to the uh, question and answer. Back to you, Lauren. Great. Thanks, Russ. Um, we will now address a few questions from the audience. If you haven't already submitted a question, you can still do so via the Q&A engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, and panelists, I will um, be directing questions um, across the panel and individually. To start, I'm going to direct a question towards Mark, and that is, what were the politics around some of the stronger mandates you put in place? Did you face significant opposition from building owners or other groups? The short answer is yes, uh, significant opposition. Uh, I think that's part of any policy work that's worthwhile is that you're going to have to uh, put in the work to try and move towards consensus. We we had a bill, original bill, um, to move towards a mandate about a year and a half earlier than the one we passed. And that one was killed um, in, in committee while it was being developed because of the, the fierce opposition. So we had to really kind of get to the core of what were the concerns of building owners outside of just change in general. How could we develop a policy where there are more 
uh, folks that agree this is the way to move forward than there were those that were in opposition. So it definitely took more process and, and us to build a coalition in order to be able to do that. And a lot of that came to the fact that we were setting up different uh, carbon caps for different building typologies and making sure that we were acknowledging that not all buildings are the same, but that those that have similar use types can probably, based on uh, all the benchmarking data and consistent data acquisition we've done over the years, really set a target that meets buildings where they are and acknowledges those that are way over it and have more to do versus those that are pretty close to it and might be able to make operational changes. So I think that was really core to this, but it also came with everyone understanding that it's that it's time to do something more significant. And that was um, part of that had to do with us, like pushing and pushing and pushing, make that happen. Great, thanks, Mark. Next question is for Dave, and that is, how did the new smaller cities compare to larger cities that you surveyed in the past within the scorecard? Sure. Um, so I'd, I'd have to look through the populations to be to be perfectly honest to to see if there's any sort of trend or pattern. It wasn't something I had looked at, but I mean that being said, I, I know that there are certainly some cities towards the top who are on the smaller side who are doing quite well. Um, you know, St. Paul is one of them, um, with it being a, a most improved city. And then cities like uh, you know Minneapolis, Hartford, and others do well um, as well, and are on the smaller side. Um, but I would have to circle back in terms of how you know, um, the, the populations for the rest of the cities. I, I don't know them offhand. Great. Thanks, Dave. This question is for Jessica, and it is a two-part question. I'm combining two unrelated questions. Um, the first being, can you just provide a little bit more clarity around what you, what policy you were referring to in terms of tuning building? I think it was tune-up policy. And second, um, could you um, describe more what it was like working with your environmental justice committee um, and how that really shaped city's activities? Sure, thank you. Uh, first, our building tune-up policy, yes, it's, it's easier for us to just call it tune-ups. Um, it's really a mandatory uh, retro-commissioning policy where build, commercial buildings 50,000 square feet and greater every five years need to do an assessment of um, operational improvements and then make those improvements. Um, so we passed that a few years ago and it is staggered by year, different building cohorts based on building size. And we have gone through, I believe the first two cohorts have been required to complete their tune-ups to date. Um, so that is our building tune-up policy. Our Environmental Justice Committee has 13 leaders um, representing different communities of color, native peoples, um, people with English as a second language, uh, or organizations that work with those communities on environmental justice issues. Uh, we launched our Environmental Justice Committee um, soon after we launched our Equity in Environment Agenda in 2016. So I, I think that committee started in 2017. And I'll say that it has been uh, a learning experience, but a really positive one to, to work with folks. Um, I think we've learned a lot uh, about the, the tension between that group setting their own agenda and us responding to what they see as the critical priorities and us wanting to bring um, some of our policies that we have in development to that group. Uh, I think when we first started, uh, our office more and more was saying, hey, we've developed these policies. Will you look at them and tell us what you think? And we realized that that was really perpetuating um, the dominant system of the city deciding what the priority should be, rather than really owning that we want our most impacted communities to set the agenda and set the priorities for the city. So we've been doing more and more of that lately, particularly right now, as we look at an economic recovery rooted in climate justice, um, we're more and more trying to take the lead from that committee. I hope that answers the questions. I think so. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> and now this question is for all panelists, so feel free to jump in. Are there some good examples of how you reconciled building energy efficiency and in low and moderate income households and rent, rent increases as a result? So have you taken any steps to prevent displacement as a result of um, residential retrofits? 
I can jump in um, just just for starters. The short answer is that it, it, we set a, a um, kind of guardrail for ourselves in the beginning that that wasn't a, a viable outcome. Um, if if the retrofits that we're requiring were going to yield rent increases, then that was a non-starter. Um, you know, New Yorkers are dealing enough as it is with um, with increased rents, and especially for more vulnerable communities, we were certain that that was not going to be something we needed to have happen. And in um, the way in which our, uh, our our city is set up with our, our, our state on the rent regulations, uh, that was something that would be possible for um, rent-regulated tenants. So we uh, we actually created a different pathway for um, being able to comply with the law for buildings that had certain percentages of rent regulated tenants. Um, there's a more prescriptive list and a less strenuous one at, at that. And then we turned our attention towards the state and we fought over the next um, you know, six to nine months to be able to work with the state to change the regulations. And subsequently, um, earlier, um, I guess to the latter part of, of, of the year, uh, the state changed its regulations to make it more difficult for owners to pass on the cost of those retrofits to, to tenants. And that increased the amount of buildings that we think are could be applicable to, to the law. And so we actually have been working with city council over the last few months, had a hearing recently to expand the, the, the realm of buildings that would be included under the law now uh, for those that can't pass it on to tenants. So I think it's important that we recognize that we're not, we need to get at those buildings. It's important, but not at the cost of, or not at the expense of those that can be support it. And so being able to create um, the the appropriate kind of legal and legislative measures that ensure protection of those tenants was a critical part of how we viewed this being like a, a law that can actually be transformative and not one that's going to be punitive. And I'll agree with Mark and just build off of what he said um, with one uh, kind of additional and specific example from Seattle. We've made sure to partner with our Office of Housing, which is our city affordable um, housing developer, uh, it, it, recognizing that they have more expertise and experience in working on these issues and in working in fighting displacement than our Office of Sustainability has had. So, uh, for example, we have last year passed a um, tax on home heating oil coupled with um, conversions from oil to clean electricity for our lowest income residents. We made sure to partner with the Office of Housing who will be conducting a lot of those conversions uh, so that we can build off of the frameworks and the structures they have in place where they will work with landlords to ensure that for a certain amount of years, rent cannot be increased once the improvements are made um, with public funds. And just to um, uh, kind of triple down on the approach, we are currently actually talking extensively with our utility about using more of their uh, conservation improvement program or SIP funds, which is a requirement here in the state of Minnesota that a certain percentage of their resources go into uh, energy efficiency work to target um, our low income uh, buildings and populations with uh, programs that will essentially provide rebates and incentives for landlords, but also tenants uh, that ensure that essentially rents uh, will not go up. On the new construction side, uh, because most of our new construction of affordable housing includes federal tax credits that are tied to um, people only paying a certain percentage of their income for rent, uh, the any added cost of uh, new energy systems in the new construction are really being borne by the public sector um, with, with those rents uh, not really being affected. Um, but this is a key area for us. It's one that we're going to focus on over the next several years, even though it's probably not the, the space where we're going to see the, the biggest reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. It's just so consistent and core to our values that we're really going to be spending a lot of time in this space in the coming years. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm now going to direct a question towards Russ, but then open it up to the larger panel. Um, to start with, um, Russ, could you, could you provide a little bit more clarity around um, St. Paul's VMT reduction goal and the date? And um, in addition, if you could speak to this and then we'll open it to others, for those looking at eliminating parking requirements, are you as the city going to require developers 
to instead offer services such as bus and transit passes, car share, bike share, et cetera? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so our, our vehicle miles traveled reduction goal is 40% uh, off of essentially current levels by 2040. We have about 5 million miles a, a day driven in St. Paul today. So we're aiming to get that number down to 3 million in 2040. Um, we are doing this through a number of different measures, uh, but uh, including working with our county, who actually controls a lot of our kind of arterial roadways in the city on road diet projects, uh, improving facilities for biking, walking, and transit, and uh, really starting to actually move from, I would say, the a lot of the work of the last 20 years in transportation, which has been sort of providing all options for everyone, to, to really starting to think about providing less space for cars um, and, and more for the other options uh, in, our, in our streets. A great example of that is uh, one of our new bikeways is going in on a freeway connector uh, that's been in place for 50 years, uh, carrying about 30,000 cars a day. We're actually doing a road diet in order to put the, the trail in. So we're actually reducing car capacity um, more and more. On the um, elimination of uh, parking minimums, Yes, we're looking at pairing that with a, an upgrade to our travel demand management ordinance that would give, uh, sim most similar to San Francisco's, uh, that would give uh, developers a, a series of options that they would be scored on in terms of the approach that they're taking to minimize car travel uh, to, their, uh, to their buildings. We also know that in getting out of the way in that equation, that lenders and developers will still want to build parking, just that we won't be requiring them to build some amount that is relatively arbitrarily set. And I jump in just to say, first, Russ, that's awesome, <laughs> good and exciting news. And I think we have a lot to learn from St. Paul. Um, we've really focused in Seattle on kind of two fronts. One is doing all we can to expand and support transit. And so that includes things like we'll have a ballot measure to support transit um, on the ballot this fall in November. Um, we, um, we, we've created bus only lanes, more bike lanes, et cetera. We've also recognized on the housing side that housing justice is climate justice and everything we can do to provide more affordable housing so that people can uh, live near where they work, play, go to school in Seattle, that will dramatically help to reduce our climate pollution. I think one additional thing just to add uh, is is we also need to be looking at opportunities that emerge um, from unexpected places. You know, New York City is, has opened up 65 miles of streets as a result of our response to the, the COVID pandemic and trying to provide more safe, open spaces for New Yorkers to socially distance themselves as well as have access to the outdoors. And, you know, I've got my eye on, on those spaces to make sure that maybe not all of them get returned to cars when, when we're finished. Um, I think that being able to look at places where we can um, you know, return, rewild uh, some of the, uh, the urban landscape and allow for it to be something where um, more bike transit, more pedestrian traffic, all of those things can be something that are reincorporated into, uh, into street landscapes uh, is a, uh, a solution that I think we should try and always look for opportunities to take advantage of and then to codify those where we can to make sure that we're, uh, we're not all of our, uh, our interventions uh, take as long as a lot of often takes with some of the long-term planning projects. Great, thank you. Dave, could you um, please remind attendees what the criteria is for a city to be included in the City Clean Energy Scorecard? Sure, sure. So we looked at, generally speaking, the 100 largest metro regions in the U.S., and then we look at the central city of those metro regions. There are a couple of cases where we include two cities from a metro region, say uh, you know, San Francisco and Oakland, uh, New York City and Newark, those sort of things, since there's two major cities in one metro region. But, but by and large, it's those central cities and metro regions. Thanks, Dave. And throughout presentations and in a lot of the questions that we've received, um, there's been mention of COVID. 
So we're obviously in challenging times with both the effect of COVID hitting city budgets, but also outrage over racial injustice across the country. How do you see both of these factors affecting your work and policies in the future? And of course, this questions for all panelists. Well, I'll jump in to offer first that um, keep centering the very real struggle that our residents are experiencing today is paramount in all we're doing. And I recognize when I'm out talking to, to our residents and in our communities, and we're talking about COVID recovery, um, what I hear more than anything else is we're still in it. Our businesses are still closed. We're still not receiving a paycheck. And we're still in a place where we're not getting federal assistance like we were before. Um, and we're not getting what we need from the federal government, which is putting more needs and pressures than ever on local governments to step up. So I want to recognize that the acute crisis of COVID, both the public health crisis and the economic crisis, we're still experiencing. Um, and in Seattle, we will experience that for some time. So first, we, we hold that in all we do. Uh, second, we know that as a local government, as we are meeting the, the direct basic needs that our residents have right now, rental assistance, food assistance, um, doing all we can to help our folks, we also need to be thinking of what are those policy interventions to ensure that our city comes back stronger than it was before. Uh, Mark mentioned um, closing some streets in New York. We've done that too. We've, I think we have about 21 miles of streets um, closed throughout Seattle. The mayor has announced that she intends to keep that permanent. Our Stay Healthy Streets will um, continue to be uh, only open to local vehicles for folks who live on those streets, but will continue to be prioritized for pedestrians and bikers, et cetera. Those are the type of things that we've been able to do during COVID to provide more spaces for people to be socially distanced but get outside that we realized works and has huge benefits in our um, uh, communities want those types of things. So we'll continue to look at how do we make these um, these changes permanent? What are more things that we can do while, again, continuing to meet um, the basic needs of our residents and, and continuing? As I said before, local government has had to um, has really had to step up and fill the gaps from our federal government and has had to do so much just to ensure that that um, basic assistance like housing assistance, like uh, food assistance it is met for our families. And I'll, I'll jump in again on, on the, the, I think it's also important to think about a point that Jessica made is that uh, people are suffering now. It is still ongoing, and it is not something that uh, is in the in the past. You know, this summer, as many of you know, uh, of course, like many summers before, it is the hottest summer re on record. And we in New York City um, kind of recognize that we're kind of facing a particular crisis early in the summer, which is that you know vulnerable seniors in in New York City would not be able to congregate, would not necessarily be able to go out to some of these open streets or into um, into rec centers or cooling centers. And so we immediately set up a program to distribute um, about 75,000 air conditioning units, free air conditioning units, and, and to, uh, to vulnerable seniors. Now, of course, in our minds and in our GHG accounting, like we're not necessarily um, excited about increasing the electricity load of, um, of New Yorkers. But the reality is that you have to meet the immediate needs of the populations that you're serving. And you can do so in a way that is responsible, that is Energy Star, and that, and we're getting more and more data about you know those um, those residents that we were able to help, and hopefully that will aid us in developing more policy and interventions that come into electrification and further um, uh, decarbonization of, of of those units. But it's something in which you know you have to keep constantly be matching. Uh, the need to service the the, the immediate needs of uh, of your your populations uh, while simultaneously trying to uh, keep an eye on where you want 
the the development of policy to go into the future. And I think that for us, we just know that heat is the most pernicious um, killer, uh, not just in our city, but in cities all around the the country and globe. And it, every summer, so being able to prioritize some of the the work around adaptation that we're doing in a lot of places is also has to be met with being able to prioritize the needs of those uh, those most vulnerable so that they can be alive and participate in the future that you're creating. And I'll just chime in and say that I think that the, the situation in 2020, all of our multiple situations have reinforced in our minds and, and I think probably to some degree in the broader public's minds that that the issues of economic security, racial justice, and climate and climate justice are are completely linked. That there is that there is no solution to the climate problem without ensuring that we're meeting people's basic needs, without ensuring that our systems become a lot more fair um, and, and less biased. And um, and I think one of the things that that COVID in particular I think has revealed is that. Most people, when we have to, can actually make some pretty significant changes in their lives um, because we have to. And I think I think it's a it's an interesting possible silver lining in terms of some of the things that we're going to need to do to address the climate crisis. Um, in in that we can actually adjust. Uh, it has to be a group project, though, and I think we've seen nationally that we've got to get on the same page that these are our goals, that we have to adjust together um, and everyone's got to do their part. Uh, I think there are ways in which um, the, the situation certainly has affected city budgets. We know everywhere uh, that are going to slow down some of our ambitions in the climate space just because new revenue or, or changed revenue is going to be harder to come by than ever. Um, but, uh, but doubling down on those sort of core values of meeting people where they are, meeting their basic needs is... Uh, been been I think shown really um, brutally uh, to to be what we have to do. Great, thank you, um, panelists, for those responses. So one last question: We're we're almost at the top of the hour, and in kind of in parting words, in a minute or so, I'd like you each to um, talk about what's next for your cities, whether it be an upcoming policy or a next step in implementation. Anything you'd like to share in about a minute or so. Well, I'll just keep going for a second. Uh, I mentioned some of these already. We're about to get our Climate Justice Advisory Board up and running. It'll be the first time we've had that. I look forward to that experience that uh, Jessica described of really having this new group change the way we approach the work. I think we think we're doing pretty well, but I know that they will help us uh, get much better at it. Uh, the other big thing I mentioned is, is moving toward uh, getting rid of parking requirements in early 21. Um, kind of that that next front of work, though, is this package that we're that we're that I described that we're talking to our utility about in terms of um, conservation energy efficiency programs, and then the next next thing, the one that I don't have the resources yet to do, is to focus on uh, the uh, urban heat problem uh, that uh, Mark and others are are describing so well. Uh, we haven't really experienced that much uh, increase in heat in the summers yet. Our winters are getting far warmer, but we're anticipating that trend and needing to really focus on things like tree canopy um, and equal access to, to cooling. And in Seattle, I, I mentioned briefly that we're developing our next update of the Seattle Energy Code, are excited to develop that uh, in a way that moves us past fossil fuel use. Uh, the mayor has asked us to look at building performance standards. Uh, we do learn from our other cities, and when they have good ideas, the mayor wants us to explore them and see if uh, if we could replicate that in Seattle. And then I mentioned as well that we're working closely with our Environmental Justice Committee on really what would an economic recovery centered in climate justice and centered in those principles of the Green New Deal look like for Seattle, and, and that's how we we want to um, really build up the framework uh, of our recovery. And in New York, I, you know, I mentioned a handful of things. One in particular, we are, you know, actively working on 
the potential development of a carbon trading platform for the city. We think that would be an amazing tool to be able to um, provide a lot of flexibility uh, on top of the, the building mandate law. Uh, you know, we are aggressively trying to also help the state seek and change the electricity mix of our city. We don't have a lot of control over that. So being able to utilize our purchasing, purchasing power to potentially um, galvanize more clean energy flowing down into New York City, whether that's from hydropower or offshore wind or anything in between. Um, but I will say one additional thing that is particularly important to us and to the work that we do um, is just kind of recognizing to everyone that there there have been a lot of uh, setbacks uh, kind of nationally in terms of a lot of the work that we're able to do. I mean, you know, in the in a short period of time, over you know, 100 in, environmental regulations have either been defunded or. Um, uh, or deprioritized, and that has made it very difficult for a lot of the work that we do, whether it's through electrification of transit or the pursuit of other um, other efficiency measures that would that would really advance the work to decarbonize our society. So I think it's important for everyone to kind of do their homework and to re re remember that we work in a context in which we would be greatly assisted and advanced. Um, by um, an ag aggressive action on the federal level. And then kind of to Jessica's point, whether it's a Green New Deal or some other context in which, um, or some of the name to, to use it, having uh, a very firm, aggressive national strategy on decarbonizing all the levels of our economy uh, is going to be the, the great work, I think, of a lot of our cities to come. We've been holding a lot of the uh, the work within our our levers right now, and but we really need to be pushing uh, forward to a kind of a larger national strategy on this. And so hopefully that will be something that um, does come about um, in in the time to come. And you know also use this as an opportunity to encourage everyone to vote in 29 days um, in whatever way in which you would like to do that. Great. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to all the panelists. And thank you all for participating in today's webcast. Again, everyone who attended will be sent a link to the on-demand recording within the next few days. So with that, thank you for joining and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.